So we are live, everyone. So good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we're all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And we are so excited, not just because it's a new year, not just because it's a new decade, but because all month long in January, we are highlighting epic earth, amazing places, amazing people that have traveled to the far reaches of the globe in pursuit of science and exploration. So thank you guys so much for joining us for that. We just had a bunch of classes join us in the last few seconds. So I don't even know how many we have with us right now, but we're gonna go one by one and give them a chance to say hi. We've got Miss Damianakos' class, grade threes in Nippian, Ontario. Hi guys. Hey, welcome in. <laughs> We've got Miss Braces and Miss Castles, grade fives in Flemington in New Jersey. Hi guys. Hey, welcome in. I love New Jersey classes. You guys are always so enthusiastic. We've got Miss Oweda's grade sixes in Vancouver, BC. Let me find your mic. There we are. Hi, guys. Oh. Hey. hey. <laughs> All right. We've got Miss Teeson's grade three fours in Surrey in BC. Hi, guys. Hey. Hey. At a school that Jill has actually visited in the past. How cool is that? We've got Miss Holt's grade fives in Innisfail in Alberta. Hi, guys. Hey. <laughs> We got people from everywhere today. It is, it's crazy. We've got Miss Curtin's grade fives in Anchorage in Alaska. Hi guys. Hey, you're so loud. You like broke the mic on your system. I love it. And then, oh, two more. We've got everyone here today. Mr. Barcinas is grade threes in Benicia in California. Let me just find them. Hey guys. <laughs> We've had a lot of California classes lately. Hey. And they've all got clipboards. We've unleashed them with clipboards. Last but not least, we've got Miss Davies, three fours in Smith's Falls, Ontario. Hi, guys. Yeah, hi. Hello. Hi. Hey. All right, so many classes, so little time. Uh, of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. So we are joined live in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada by Jill Heiner. So she is an explorer in residence for the Can Royal Canadian Geographical Society. She is one of Canada's foremost explorers. She's the greatest cave diver in the world. She has been featured in every type of media you can possibly imagine as one of the world's top explorers. Today, she is gonna take us on a journey under the ice in Canada's north to explore one of the most unique and amazing habitats in the world. I wanna not spoil her thunder, so without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us today, Jill, and take it away. My pleasure. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you and also excited to know that there's two classes that are really close to me in Nepean and Smith's Falls. I'm actually in Carlton Place, so I'm halfway in between uh, both of you. So it's great to be here with you. I'm just going to hit screen share here because the images that I have are way prettier than me. So let's do that so you can see. And I'm just going to hit play. And I think you should probably see that by now. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Awesome. So I'm Jill Heinerth, Explorer in Residence for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society and Underwater Explorer. And today we're going to talk about being under thin ice in the polar regions. But first, let me give you a quick intro to some of the stuff I do because it gets people pretty excited about the images. Um, as an underwater explorer, I travel all over the world. I learned to dive in Canada, in Tobermory, uh, but you might find me in the Arctic, you might find me in the middle of a Florida swamp, uh, you may find me in underwater caves, because those are especially um, my area of focus, is these water-filled passages deep under the earth, and they're incredibly exciting to explore. But that skill has also taken me under the ice, both in the Arctic, this is in the Northwest Passage, in oh. a place called Lancaster Sound. Jill, sorry yeah. to interrupt, you're, you're not switching slides. We're I'm still, not switching no, slides. No, we're still in your first first picture, as cool, cool. as it is. Okay, <laughs> well, isn't that interesting? Uh, what if we do, it, it's switching on my screen, what if we do it this way, can you see? That's perfect, yeah, that's great. Oh, okay, so we just don't wanna hit play then. All right, so that's fun, all right. <laughs> Sorry, quick zip through. Here's a couple quick pictures. There's the caves <laughs> that I dive in. Uh, yeah, so inside underwater caves and beneath the ice. Uh, this one is where we left off, is on top of the sea ice in the Arctic um, in, when I was shooting a film recently under thin ice. 
but you also find them in hot places in the Sahara Desert because we actually have dive sites in the Sahara Desert and we learn as much from these warm places as cold ones. What I do takes a lot of equipment in order to swim in these really crazy places. Sometimes I might even be hauling up to 500 pounds of equipment underwater in places like caves, inside of volcanoes like this one, the Canary Islands, um, or even in remote places where we have to transport all this very same gear on donkeys um, or whatever way we can. As a Canadian, I dive a lot in Canada from the West Coast. This is from uh, uh, near Vancouver for my friends out there to the East Coast. So I'm not always in, in caves or under the ice. Sometimes I'm diving these remarkable shipwrecks, uh, which are incredibly stunning artificial reefs now, and even in underwater mines, mines that are flooded with water where we can swim and follow these unique passages. But today is all about the ice. So let's talk about that. Um, this shot is from inside an iceberg in Antarctica. And I was the very first person ever to cave dive inside an, Arctic, or an Antarctic iceberg. But let's start with the north. Let's start with the Canadian Arctic and, and surrounding area. And specifically, let's start in Greenland because that's where the birthplace of a lot of our ice comes from. Some facts about Greenland are that it's the second largest ice body in the world. So there's the most ice on top of Antarctica and then the second most on top of Greenland. And some of that is more than a mile or two kilometers thick, even in Antarctica, like up and beyond three kilometers thick. It's so big, this area of ice in Greenland, that if it all melted and came off of Greenland, we could have as much as 24 feet of sea level rise occurring. Now, icebergs come from big ice sheets like Greenland or Antarctica. So snow falls on places like Greenland and it builds up over time. And those glaciers, even though they're like solid ice and snow, they start moving downhill towards the ocean because they're heavy. So they move like water, even though it's ice and snow. And when they get to the coast, they start to break off and fall into the ocean. And when that happens in Greenland, what, what happens is that the ice then follows the natural ocean currents and it crosses over to Canada, to places like Baffin Island, these huge pieces of ice. Now, icebergs um, can be really, really large. And as they drift in the ocean, they can drift eight and a half miles or 14 kilometers per day. And when they get all the way over to Canada, to Baffin Island and in our Canadian Arctic, they get stuck and frozen into the sea ice for the winter. And they stay there for the winter until in the warmth of the spring and summer, they break up and start to travel south again. And as they travel south, they start to melt because the icebergs move down the coast of the Canadian Arctic, down Baffin Island, down Labrador, down Newfoundland. And a couple of icebergs in history have even made it as far as Bermuda. And that'd be a pretty surprising thing to see if you were on the beach in Bermuda. But this is a picture of Greenland. And this is what some of these icebergs look like when they've calved away from the Greenland ice sheet. What you're looking at in this picture is a very small picnic table with a big chunk of ice behind it. Those are actually big chunks of iceberg that have already broken away from the ice sheet and are now moving floating out into Disco Bay in Alilasat, Greenland. And this is Disco Bay here with some big icebergs floating away. And this gives you a sense of how large some of these big chunks are. They're pretty beautiful. And in the summertime, we don't get a lot of night. We get these beautiful sunsets and sunrises and in a lot of the summer, 24 hours of, of sunlight. When you're traveling around in Disco Bay uh, on a boat, it can get foggy. And when it does, we see these massive icebergs kind of sticking out of fog and cloud banks. And they're pretty beautiful 
but scary because you don't want to run your boat into them. <laughs> it would be like running into a cliff. Here's a quick little video, I'll see if it'll play, of icebergs calving in Greenland. Here we go. So Jill, this is representing the ice being lost over the last few decades. Yeah. So, oops, let me stop that. There we go. Yeah. So what happens is um, when the ice calves away and moves into Disco Bay and drifts away, that ice uh, front basically recedes further and further and further back. And so more and more ice is calving every single year. So it's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, after it does that and drifts across to Canada, it gets locked up in the sea ice in the fall. So when it gets cold, then the ocean starts to freeze and it traps icebergs in amongst the flat ocean frozen um, surface. And when you get to Canada, this is a place called Eclipse Sound at the bottom of the picture. You can see there's little mountains poking up um, out of the ice, but on the right hand side of that photo, you can see kind of an edge and then more broken up ice. So this is just as the winter's coming and the sea ice is freezing and there'll be icebergs trapped in that ice. The sea ice is pretty flat right up to the mountains of, of Bylot Island and Baffin Island. And the Inuit people call that sea ice the land because in the winter, it enables them to get out on top of the ocean, move around, hunt traditionally, and get to other communities. And Inuit elders teach us a lot about the ice because they have a lot of indigenous knowledge passed down through the generations. Now the sea ice, the frozen surface of the ocean is really important because it represents the very bottom of the food chain in the Arctic. There's algae colonies, zooplankton and phytoplankton that are literally trapped in the ice. And that sea ice, as it melts in the springtime, will um, release these nutrients into the ocean. The sea ice also gives us a white surface of the ocean, and that reflects the uh, sun's rays back into the atmosphere and kind of acts like an insulating blanket to keep the ocean from getting too hot. When the sea ice is gone, the ocean is dark and it absorbs sunlight and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. So the sea ice is really important for helping to regulate ocean and global climate. Um, here's a picture of the underside of the sea ice where you can see some of the algae that's hanging on the bottom of the sea ice and that's part of the base of the food chain. So sea ice is really, really important. If it's all gone, it disrupts how the food chain works. And we're worried that the sea ice, because the world is getting warmer now, could be gone as soon as the year 2040. And if that sea ice disappears, not only will we have issues with the, with the bottom of the food chain, the algae, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, but all the way up to the polar bears, the top of the food chain. When we travel out on top of the sea ice, we go to places like this. We use sleds and skidoos, and this little hole in the ice is actually a hole that's been made by a seal who's broken a hole all the way to the surface so he can poke his nose up there to breathe because seals need to get to the surface to breathe. That's where they become vulnerable um, to predators like polar bears. Now, um, if you want to learn more about this, I did a, a TV program recently called Under Thin Ice on the nature of things. And so the Canadian schools can stream this for free on CBC GEM. Uh, it'll come to the American uh, broadcasting sometime in 2020 soon. Um, so uh, you'll get a chance to see it too. I'm just going to show you a quick little minute and a half from this so you get a sense of what we learn in this film. Whoops. Let's see, there we go. So 
Jill, the video is working, but if there's audio right now, it's not coming through. No. Oh, the audio is not coming through. No. That's okay. Oh, okay. That happens sometimes. So if you want to explain what's happening, that'd be great. And by the yeah, way, I will, sure. I will share this video with all the classes when we're done. Great. Yeah. So this is the sea ice. This is the, the surface that I'm standing on and you can see it moving up and down. And that I think of like the ocean breathing, it's the waves that will affect that. And on top of the sea ice, we see an incredible amount of life. All the life is following the sea ice in the very edge. Um, Cause this is where the seals will pop up onto the surface. This is where the polar bears will hunt the seals. This is where we see bowhead whales. And this is a bowhead and we see belugas and we see narwhals that have tusks. And this is where we go to do our filming. The issue is that the ice is disappearing at a really alarming rate. And that's why we need to document this life um, as much as we can. Oh, let me stop that and move on. So yeah. that's the edge of the sea ice, what we call the flow edge, okay? And so sometimes we dive in on the sea ice and sometimes we go all the way out to the edge. We also dive in places where the ice is breaking apart and we can get down into the water there in these cracks that lead to um, beneath the surface where we can experience these animals. This is one of those Greenland icebergs stuck in the sea ice. And so we'll dive right around that iceberg because there's little open water bits where we can get into the water. When we go all the way down to the seafloor, we see an amazingly beautiful, um, colorful uh, garden of life something that almost looks tropical when you see it. And then on the surface, we see this. We see sometimes a real jumbled edge to the flow edge. And sometimes we see a very sharp edge where the ocean meets the ice. And every day that breaks away and we get miles and miles more of ice floating out into the sea, like these giant Greenland icebergs that will break away. When we work out there, sometimes we have to camp and sometimes now with global climate change, the camping conditions aren't so great because there's a lot of water on top of the ice. And so as we're camping, we'll have a few inches of water even in our tents and we sleep on cots to try and stay above that water. As we move around on top of the ice, as you can see this pooling water um, becomes an issue. The snowmobiles almost become more like jet skis as we're traveling around spraying up rooster tails of, of water. And as the Arctic gets warmer and warmer, we also get mosquitoes, like mosquitoes like you have never seen mosquitoes, just absolute clouds of them late in the summer in the Arctic. So as we get into like August and September in the Arctic at the very warmest um, points, uh, we'll have areas of the Arctic where all the ice is gone. And then we're fishing and, and eating some of the traditional fish like this Arctic char. And sometimes we'll even live in these little cabins to protect us from polar bears that will predate on us. They're hunting us because we're part of the food chain too. So this little 10 foot by 10 foot cabin, I'll share with five or six other people. And we'll all fight over one plug for all our computers and batteries to charge is that plug leads to the generator. But when we're up there, we get a chance to both photograph and even be in the water with some pretty frightening predators um, with walruses, also with polar bears, um, the very apex predator of the north. And that's the last thing that I see before I'm diving underwater to swim away from the polar bears. <laughs> to give you a sense of the size of a polar bear, here's his footprint from sort of top to bottom on that slide, and that's my hand beside it. And when we go diving with the polar bears, we'll be working out of a canoe, and the polar bear is as big as the canoe, so pretty um, remarkable. Uh, but uh, the ice is such a dynamic environment. It's a real privilege for me to be able to document, um, document these places. Now, I want to bring your attention to one more um, educational asset. Besides the movie, Under Thin Ice, um, we created an app. It's free on both 
Apple and Android platforms at the Google Play or Apple App Store. And it's called uh, Discover the Arctic. And uh, you can uh, check it out. It follows our journey. And it also tells the story of all of these different uh, animals of the north. Gives you a lot of little quizzes and chances to, to learn things, some games, and lots of little video segments. So that's free on uh, Android and on Mac. It's both available in English and French for the bilingual schools. So check that out in the, uh, in the app store. Fantastic. Yeah. But now I think we should probably stop sharing and open this to some questions because there's so much to, to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, there, there sure is. Uh, that okay. was spectacular. Thank you so, so much for that presentation. All right. Yeah, no worries. And, yeah, I will be sharing the app and the, the Nature of Things uh, video with all you guys at the end. So do look Thanks. forward to that. Mm -hmm. But let's dive in. So in addition to our eight live classes, we've got at least five watching on YouTube live. So if you guys want to take questions there, please do. Yeah. Uh, let's start, though, with uh, Miss Damien Ackles' class right down the street from Jill. Uh, if you guys want to mm -hmm. pick us up, come on up. Come on. Um, how long have you been diving? I've been diving for almost, well, over 30 years now. So a long time. <laughs> yeah, I know. That makes me old, doesn't it? <laughs> I want to actually uh, uh, do a quick segue off that. When yeah. do kids start to dive, Jill? So for the classes that are with us today, when can they start mm. to dive? So when you're 10 years old, you can start taking diving lessons. Um, and you can even start other activities before that, like snorkeling or free diving, you can do sooner. So uh, anyone who's watching today can definitely get into the water and get underwater one way or another. Fantastic. All right, uh, let's go to Flemington. So Miss Brace is Miss Castle. Mm. If you guys have one, go for it. Is it ever dangerous to be diving? Sure. Yeah. A lot of what I do is pretty dangerous. So if I jump in the water with a polar bear, the polar bear is chasing after me. That's pretty dangerous. But also under the ice or inside a cave, I have to be able to solve all of my problems, like with a roof over my head. I can't just swim back to the surface when something scares me or if something goes wrong. So it takes a lot of training. It takes a lot of equipment backup and preparation. Um, so we take classes, we train to be proficient, and then we take a lot of gear in case something breaks. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Jill's actually done some other presentations where she solely talked about uh, fear and danger and in some of her diving expeditions in the past. If you want to check that out, it's on our YouTube channel as well. Um, all right. I miss Oweda's group. If we want to go to Vancouver, come on up, guys. You guys are good, we just need to. Do you guys have a question? Can you ask? I don't know. Kristen, loudly. We're not No, no, just ask. We can hear you. Have you ever been injured during your dives? Have you ever been injured during your dives, Jill? Yes. Uh, so I've had a lot of little things like I've been um, bitten by an eel. <laughs> minor, minor issue. Um, so I've had little things like that. I did get something called decompression sickness caused from um, the diving itself. And so when we go underwater, we're kind of like a soda pop bottle. Our bodies actually absorb inert gas, right? So, so you know how you've got little gas bubbles inside of a soda pop bottle. If, if you just carefully take the cap off a soda pop bottle and depressurize it, it'll just kind of go and do nothing special, right? But if you shake a soda pop bottle and you rip the cap off, what you're doing is reducing pressure really fast. And that would be the same thing if I swam too fast to the surface, the gas in my body tissues can come out of solution and cause bubbles. And that's called decompression sickness. And it can cause little issues like pain or a skin rash, or it can cause big issues like paralysis or even death. So we have to be very careful about timing how we come back to the surface nice and slow. I'm really glad we got that question. Thanks so much, Jill. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. All right, Miss Teeson's class, if you guys have one, go for it. Why do you go in caves when there's nothing to die for in there? Oh, well, caves are, is a really good question. So caves are like museums of natural history. We learn about climate change. We learn about unique biology. There are animals that swim inside the caves. Um, we learn about archaeology because some um, civilizations have left behind 
um, cultural things like pottery and artifacts inside of caves. So there's a lot we can learn inside of caves. And so I work with scientists collaborating on research um, to you know, bring this information back to the world. It's almost like, you know, why we go to outer space. We go to outer space to learn about things that we don't know about yet. Excellent yeah. question. Excellent question. I'm gonna take two quick ones from YouTube because they're really fast. Yeah. Uh, so Miss Cream's class joining us in Guelph, Ontario, wanted mm -hmm. that, how do seals breathe underwater? Ooh, they don't. That's a good question. They actually swim around for a long time and hold their breath. And then they come all the way back to the surface pop their little head up and then you can actually hear them when you're out on the ice you can hear them just go to go and they'll they'll stay on the surface for a little bit and then dive back down again and they create a whole bunch of holes they've got um they've got nails right? <laughs> they'll actually you know knock this hole open for themselves now that's when they're most vulnerable because a uh, polar bear with its big claws waits just downwind of one of those holes. And when it sees a seal's nose pop up, it just goes whack, grabs it, and then boom, 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 pulls the seal up through the hole and eats it. So they have to come to the surface to breathe. Very cool. I like how we ended up with this terrifying polar bear story in that answer. Thank you for that, Jill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, Miss Anthony's class joining us, Octorara Elementary in Pennsylvania. They wanted mm -hmm. to ask, do polar bears have a lot of teeth, which you sort of just answered, but please dive in. <laughs> yeah, polar bears are, they're terrifying. They, they are, to me, <laughs> I mean, they're majestic, they're beautiful, but they are, when I'm out in the Arctic and they're out in the Arctic, they're hunting me. <laughs> they need a lot to eat to make a polar bear, tons and tons of things they need to eat. So when you think about it, the polar bear needs to rely on the entire food chain. So the phytoplankton, the soup, zooplankton, the shrimp, the krill, the fish, all the way up to the seals. And then the polar bear eats the seals. So tons and tons of things. So they've got big teeth to chew meat. Fantastic. All right. I feel bad. There's this whole lineup joining in, in California. So Mr. Barsunas' class, if you yeah. guys want to come up for a question, go for Excellent. it. <laughs> what will happen in 2040 when, when all the ice caps go gone? Wow. Yeah. yeah. So if we lose the sea ice, then um, obviously uh, it'll change everything about the Arctic. Uh, so now ships will be able to sail through the Arctic. And that means people might start oil drilling. They might start mining. And that might sound like a good thing, but it's not necessarily a good thing for the environment. The animals that survive by like birthing and feeding around the sea ice are going to have trouble. Like the polar bears are already having trouble finding seals because there's less ice. So they're spending more time in the water, more time on the land. And when they get hungry and they can't find seals and they got to go raid birds nests for eggs and a polar bear needs a lot of eggs to fill up. So there's those kinds of impacts on the wildlife. There's also impacts potentially on how our earth climate is regulated because there are warm parts of the earth and cold parts of the earth and the ocean currents actually descend and they go come up and down like big conveyor belts that carry warmth and coolness to different parts of the planet. And so some of the answers we don't know yet, but we do know that it'll have an effect on the wildlife. It'll have an effect on sort of geopolitics, I guess, and then also an effect on global temperatures. So it's a, that's a very complex answer <laughs> and a great question. Thank you for that. It's a very complex question. And, and that was a really yeah. good information of a lot of the issues associated with it. So thank you, Jill. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's go to Ms. Holt's class. If you guys have one, come on up. I love these questions, guys. You guys are doing fantastically, by the yeah, way. Yeah, they're really good. Yeah. Oh, your audio is not on for some reason. I don't know why. You're demuted, okay. but we can't hear you. I don't know why. Let's see if we can get that working. Try now. No, it's still not coming through. Okay. So I'm going to come back in a second and we'll see if we can get that working. Worst case scenario, there's a way to type in questions. So I'll we'll walk through that if we can't get it working, but just mess with that for a second and we'll head to Miss uh, Curtin's class. If you guys have a question, come on up. So our, let me make sure we're doing, okay. Our question has sort of, there are two parts that are related. <laughs> and um, the first part of it is, what got you into diving? And then the oh. second part is, what's your, how long does your air last? 
what's uh-huh. your longest dive? And what's your longest dive? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I started uh, uh, diving because I really wanted to explore. I kind of wanted to be an astronaut when I was a little kid, but there was no space program in Canada and there were no women astronauts. <laughs> so it was really a desire to explore that got me into diving. Um, now, how long your air lasts is a really fun question because the deeper we go, the faster our air gets used up because when we're under increased pressure, we're actually um, inhaling more molecules because the air is denser. So it's like we're, we're breathing thicker air the deeper we go. So our gas supply doesn't last as long. Now a normal scuba tank that you might have seen before might last someone an hour on the surface, but if they're 100 feet or 30 meters deep, it'll last like a quarter of that time. So it'll only last like 15 minutes that deep, right? Now, my longest dive mission was 22 hours. <laughs> so it's a pretty long mission, but that was using a really special kind of equipment. That's the same equipment that an astronaut uses to make a spacewalk. It's called a rebreather. And what it does is it recycles our breath and captures all of the bubbles and we get to reuse it over and over again. So it's a, a special kind of thing that extends the, uh, the gas supply. Super cool. Okay. All right, I'm gonna check in with Ms. Holt. She's typing in some questions just in case. Yeah. You should be good in theory, Ms. Holt. Let's okay. see if we can hear you. Hey, yeah. we're good. How are you? All right, come on up here, Yella. Sorry for the trouble. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple girls who spent their evening last night researching you. Oh! And these are some of the questions that they've come up with for you. Yeah. Excellent. Right into the computer. What was the best experience you've had? Ooh. No pressure. <laughs> One of my very favorites was swimming with about a hundred humpback whales and in a place where there, there was so much capelin, this fish, because the humpback whales were eating the capelin. There was so many capelin that I couldn't see anything but fish. And then all of a sudden, woof, the fish open up and boom, this giant whale swims through. Um, and then the whale was swimming so close to me that I could reach out and touch it and touch its baby that it, that it was swimming with. So that was pretty amazing. My face hurts from smiling during this presentation. I'm sure yeah. some people do. This is very cool stuff. Um, and and Nicole, an, we will, we, oh, go ahead, Jill. Yeah, there, I, there was another one of the girls that had- Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll go, we'll go right back with Holt's class. Yeah. If you guys have your second one, go for it now. I love that you guys did research, by the way. We'd love to hear that sort of thing. Uh -huh. What food do you eat when you're on your trips? Ah, <laughs> yeah. well, I eat whatever the locals eat generally, because I find that I, that I stay healthy that way. I don't get sick this might surprise you, I also eat underwater. So on those really long, like that 22 hour mission, obviously I had to eat because I was hungry. And my favorite underwater food is a chocolate milk drinking box, like those Tetra packs, because they, when they get wet, they kind of flatten out. But as long as you don't lose the little teeny straw with the point on the end of it, you can just jam it in the box and drink it out of the corner of your mouth. Fantastic, all right. Uh Let's finish up our last round of, of first round of questions uh, with Miss yeah. Davies' class. If you guys want to come up, go for it. Okay, Carson, stand up and say your question. Hopefully they can see you. Yeah, yeah you're good. Yeah. What do you wear underwater to stay warm? Ooh, yeah. good one. I wear something called a dry suit. So in theory, <laughs> it should be completely dry. It like seals around my neck. It seals around my wrists. My head gets wet. So I wear like a neoprene hood, uh, but the dry suit will keep me pretty warm. And underneath the dry suit, I wear these really thick layers of undergarments that look almost like what you might wear on a snowmobile. So pretty thick stuff. Yeah, excellent. All right. Mm -hmm. I, I want to take a few questions from groups on YouTube and then we'll dive right back in with a whole other round. We are whipping through these guys. This is yeah. So Miss Dan's class, also in Benicia, California, wanted to ask, uh, how does the melting of icebergs affect animal habitats? So um, the melting of, of, of icebergs uh, can be an entire animal habitat. So when I went to Antarctica and uh, I went to intercept the largest iceberg in recorded history, it was the size of Jamaica and it broke off the Ross ice shelf and moved into the ocean. And our question was, 
will it carry all the animals with it? Do they just think they're on an island and they're slowly drifting north and the weather's getting nicer <laughs> as their iceberg is melting away? Um, but basically, like they're, they were moving with the habitat. So sometimes even in the middle of the Davis Strait in between Greenland and Baffin Island, we'll, we'll see um, you know, different animals on top of icebergs and, um, and they're like moving along with it. Now the sea ice when it disappears um, can really take out the whole ecosystem that's used for birthing, calving and feeding. Like walruses get up out of the water to soak up the sun and warm up. Um, and when they can't find ice to get out of the water, you know, onto, then they might be farther and farther from their clamming grounds where they like to dig the clams and things out of the, out of the ground. So it's a, it's a very complicated thing, but in general, the loss of ice means the loss of habitat and more stress on the ecosystem. Yeah, it's something that we cover in a lot of conservation topics, but habitat loss is, is the principal cause of loss of biodiversity. You lose the area where you live, whether that's yeah. the ice, whether it's a forest or grassland, that is what that has the biggest effect on. I'm glad we covered that question. Yeah, I mean, if I had to travel another 100 kilometers to a grocery store, I wouldn't get there in time to feed myself <laughs> before I got hungry, right? You just strap more chocolate, you know, water, chocolate. Yeah. Water, yeah. Be set. Um, all right, uh, we've got a few more YouTube questions I'll take in a minute, but I want to dive in with our second round of, of live questions. So let's go back to Miss Demi and Aquas' class. If you guys want to come mm -hmm. on up again, go for it. Okay. <laughs> How far can you go down yeah. until uh, yeah. you run out of air? Until you run out of air. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my deepest dive is about 460 feet deep. So that's pretty deep. Uh, so uh, the deepest scuba dive that someone's done from the surface and returned to the surface is over a thousand feet. It's really, really risky though. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of people who've tried to make records by going deeper have, have not made it home again. Um, when I went 460 feet deep, that was on a project in Bermuda where we were studying global climate change. And so I, I don't like to deep dive necessarily. I, I have to weigh the risk versus the reward to science. And so in that case, it seemed um, worth it. Yeah, very cool. I'm so glad we got that in and, and some of the dangerous elements of this, that it's not something that you undertake with for the faint of heart. Oh no. <laughs> uh, all right, let's go back to Flemington. Uh, if you guys have another one, class is there, come on up. Um, have you found any interesting stuff in caves? Yeah, I found Holy so God. much interesting stuff in caves. <laughs> One of the coolest things is the cave animals, though. Like we have little crustaceans um, that have no color. So they look white or clear and no eyes. They don't even have eyes because they live their whole life in the dark. They don't need eyes. But they have other really interesting sensory organs all over their body. And we don't even understand too much about them. My favorite animal in the cave is a crustacean called remipede. He has venomous fangs and pincers, so he'll grab his prey like a vampire, bite into it, inject it with venom, turn the guts of the animal into jello, and then suck the insides of the animal over time to feed. So it's like the vampire of the caves. He's only that big, but if he was like the size of a cat, he'd be the deadliest thing on earth. So that's a pretty cool animal. <laughs> the faces of the kids while you were telling that story is priceless. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, all right, a quick question from a group on YouTube. Uh, Mr. Hobdebo's grade twos in Sexsmith, Alberta, wanted to ask, how what's the closest you've gotten to some of these Arctic animals? Oh, very close. Um, so the polar bear is closer than I want to ever again. <laughs> Um, uh, but yeah, very close. Polar bears, walruses, um, the narwhals, with, they're the ones that have the tusks on them, belugas, bowhead whales, um, even orcas pretty close too. So yeah, I've been very fortunate. You talked about, uh, you know, a baby humpback coming so close that you could actually touch mm -hmm. this, like how close, like a few feet from these animals that we're talking about, just to be yeah, so I've actually touched the humpback. So like literally the mother kept coming by with her calf right by me and sort of turning her belly towards me and showing off. And I think Jelly, Jessie's heard this story before, but after she came around a few times to show me her baby and just kept swimming back around, 
her husband, a big bull humpback, came by and he came really, really close to me and brought his tail fluke like woof, right in front of my camera. So strong that it kind of blew me backwards in the water column. And then as he did that, he took a giant crap. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly I was swimming through tons of whale poop um, in the water column. So that's pretty close. <laughs> that is as, as close as you never wanted to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Somehow being underwater, that was a cool experience. It's pretty cool. It's very, it's very unique. Uh, yes. The classes haven't done that before. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, let's head back to Vancouver. Ms. Oeda's class. Come on up, guys. All right, Noble. Um, have you found any artifacts in Yes, uh, we find a lot of artifacts in caves because a lot of um, cultures use caves as portals to the next world or ceremonial places, basically. And so we find pottery, we find arrowheads, we even find human remains, we find animal remains. Um, some cultures use caves as a place for funerals. And so that's why we might find like entire skeletons inside the cave. So lots and lots of artifacts, especially in places like Mexico um, and even in the Bahamas. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, I'm Ms. Teason's class. Come on up guys. What made you so interested in underwater diving? Well, you know, as a kid, I, I loved watching Jacques Cousteau on TV and learning about the different dives that he was doing with his team. Um, but also as a young person, I was very interested in science in general, but not necessarily like specializing in one part of science. Like I didn't want to just specialize in, in one type of, you know, geology or rock or something like that. I wanted to learn about geology and biology and and archaeology and paleontology and, and engineering and research. I wanted to do it all. And, and so the underwater world became that environment where I could get involved in a lot of different science and satisfy these questions I had, the curiosity. Yeah. I apologize in advance. We're never going to be able to get through all the questions that everyone yeah. has today because you guys are so fantastic. But I'm going to go back to Mr. Barcinas' class. If you guys have, you know what, you have two. Let's take two for you guys. You two have been waiting mm -hmm. patiently a long time. So come on up and, and ask one and then you can do another. Oh, sorry. Could you say that a little, a little closer to the camera? How many caves have you been in? How many, How many caves? caves? Yeah. Boy, I would say hundreds, because I've done over 7,500 dives in caves all over the world. So hundreds of different caves. Yeah, great question. All right. Uh, we'll go right back to California. Yeah, Do you have another one? one more? What was your favorite experience? Oh, my favorite experience would probably be, you know, I really love diving off the west coast of um, British Columbia. So a little north from where you guys are now. Um, but I really like it out there because I get to swim with sea lions and, um, and giant octopus and sometimes with whales. Uh, so I really like some of those big marine mammals. Fantastic. All right, we're gonna take three mm -hmm. more live questions. One more from YouTube. So I'm gonna go to Miss Holt's class first. Uh, mm -hmm. Come on up guys. What is your favorite animal? My favorite animal, hmm, I really like whale sharks. Those are pretty cool. They're huge, polka dotted. Um, they look more like whales than sharks and they're beautiful to swim with. Yeah, we did a session on whale sharks a couple of years back where they we talked about the fact that they have more babies than any other kind of sharks. This shark the size of a school bus has 360 babies. Wow, I didn't know that. It's very cool. That's neat. All right, uh, let's head to Miss uh, Curtin's class. Oh, ben, come on up. Come on up. <laughs> All right. Um, I have a question. What was the scariest situation you've ever been in? Ooh, I've been in a few. Um, the polar bear diving was pretty scary, um, but I've also been behind a scientist who was stuck in an underwater cave and I had to figure out how to get her unstuck and patch a broken guideline and deal with some broken um, scuba equipment. A lot of things that went wrong on that dive and that was kind of scary, but, uh, but we both got home fine. <laughs> uh, no doubt a testament to your skill and experience in, in situations like that. So 
Fantastic. All right. I want to take one more question from YouTube. Uh, so Ms. Trombley's class joining us in, in minus 31 degrees in, in campus casing, Ontario, a student that's asked a lot of questions online in the past. So I love that she's, she's so keen. I um, wanted to ask, do you think you've discovered all the animals down there, Jill? Oh, no. See, the cool thing is, is that um, there we discover new species all the time. So both small species in the cave things that are, you know, not surprising that we've escaped finding them, but we even find things like in Antarctica, we found a new subspecies of killer whale. So there's still big animals on this planet yet to discover. Fantastic. All right. And we are going to wrap up with one last question from Ms. Davies' class. Mm -hmm. You guys want to wrap us up? Go for it. Okay. Nice one. What can we do to help prevent um, having no more ice? Oh, great question. Yeah, so we don't have the big solutions yet for climate change. Like we're going to have to learn how to use less fossil fuels like oil and gas, but we're also going to have to learn how to get carbon out of the atmosphere. And those are big problems, right? But what we can all do now is be as environmentally sensitive as possible. So buy less things, recycle everything, reuse things. Um, so anything that you can do to be a good steward of the planet will also help climate change and loss of sea ice too. Outstanding. Uh, thank you so, so much for all this, Jill. This has been amazing. Again, I know we can't pause to take all the questions that you guys will have. Um, that was actually a perfect question to wrap up on. It sure so was. What I'd love to do is I'm going to turn it over to all our classes um, and do you, everyone's microphone. If you guys could all join me in saying a huge thank you to Jill you are all now demuted. Go for it. <laughs> Thank you guys so, so much. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. This is fantastic. And, and if you wanted to celebrate Epic Earth, you couldn't do it any better than with Jill. Check out her links. We're going to pass along some stuff when we're done too. And, uh, just and if you have more questions, just send them, send them through the links or into the planet.com. Reach out. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Have a wonderful okay. rest of your day, everyone. And